we don't need, we don't need to take it for granted what, what just happened. And uh, man, I'm telling you, I remember when we uh, first moved here and uh, we were baptizing people. And uh, look, I had people in uh, one, one particular man in a church, um, another church, say, man, we haven't baptized one person in seven years. And, uh, and God is just, at that time, God was just pouring out his blessing on us. And people were, you know, the Bible says if you lift up Jesus' name, he will draw all men to himself. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing here. And so we are celebrating. Can we celebrate those guys who just went public with their faith? It's so exciting. Man, I wouldn't rather do anything else. That those people just said, I am not ashamed of Jesus. And uh, so, man, I was so proud of Kevin. We got in and out of there. We lifted him in. We airlifted that brother. And uh, so good. Um, we have a lot to celebrate over the last couple of weeks. You know, we've uh, been helping with storm relief along with other churches and uh, just, been, just been a blast. Easter, Easter. Guys, I'm going to tell you, I love being your pastor, uh, especially in times like Easter where you guys serve. So, so many of you served so well uh, at Easter time. And I'm going to tell you it was worth it. I want to share a stat with you. Um, it's totally worth the effort. In all, in all, okay, we had 34,742 attend around the state including Good Friday. That is a lot of people at Easter services right there. And uh, one guy in my men's group, I'm going to tell you this quick story. He, uh, his granddaughter, who is over at the house, comes to the house quite often. Anyway, his granddaughter invited their little neighbor friend uh, to, come and, uh, to come to Easter. And so uh, she, she did. They all got dressed up together, and they came. Uh, that little girl who she invited got saved at Easter and just got baptized. So I think that's pretty cool. Isn't that why we do it? I mean, and in all, for, for this campus here in Heber Springs, we had 75 decisions for Christ. Recommitments or first-time decisions, 75 people. It's awesome. So, yes, we're starting a new, a new series called What is a Christian? And we will explore that in the coming weeks. Um, right now, to kick off this talk, I want to ask you guys a question. Are y'all ready? But it's not that question. Is the, how many of y'all in here enjoy a good movie? Like, you just love watching a good movie. Okay, yeah, me too. But for me, it's got to have some adventure in it, man. It's got to be adventurous, you know? Like, I can't really stomach a movie that has a bunch of people sitting around talking a lot, all right? That's like my regular life. I don't want any more of that, all right? I want, I want action, man. I gotta, and machine guns definitely sweeten the deal for me, okay? <laughs> but uh, I just love adventure. Here's what I really love. I love seeing stories of people who leave behind, they leave behind their old life, and they go forward looking for adventure. They're looking for significance. They're looking for some discovery, anything like that, a new purpose or just a better life. I just love that kind of story. Look, the Spirit of God, I'm going to tell you something. This, this, what, what I just described is something that the Lord put inside of us. Did you know that? The inside of each one of you, we have this spirit of like leaving some things behind, pursuing something new. That's the spirit of Jesus. And you're going to see it as I talk to you about this in the word. It's the same spirit he had. Look at, look at this, Hebrews 12. Y'all go to Hebrews 12. This is verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders just throw that stuff off, he says. And the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Did you know you have a race marked out for you? You have that. God has a race marked out for you. Okay? And he says, well, let's run that race, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Did y'all catch that word, pioneer? That's what Jesus is. See, Jesus blazed a trail so we could follow him on that trail, on that brand new trail. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, here's another therefore. You know what they say about that word? If you see therefore in the Bible, you better stop and see what it's there for. That's right. Some of you are biblically trained. I see that. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Aren't you glad that verse is in the Bible? See, there's this new, new life that we're to grab hold of that's totally different than the life we used to live. Are y'all still with me so far? And then it's like 
a whole new world has opened up for us who are in Christ. Sadly, though, so many believers, especially in the South, they just never really see their faith this way, right? They just, they just see uh, their faith as like an add-on to their life, a really good, like Jesus is a really good add-on to their life. Can y'all look at me for a second? Jesus is not an add-on, okay? I have a new life to live, and I got a new trail that I'm riding on. That's the way it should be, amen? So I want to talk to you real quickly about three attitudes that can settle in on you. If, once you're saved, there's like these three mindsets that I find that can really get a hold of you, and one of them is the one we want. Then I want to show you four things that we do as a church, but really as a believer, okay? And so first thing is this. I want you to write these down. Three attitudes, and I'll tell them to you, and then I'll break each one of them down quickly. Three attitudes that can really take hold of a believer, and uh, they are the pioneer mindset, the settler mindset, and then the museum keeper. Let me talk about this one first. Museum keeper. Write that down. See, every museum has a keeper or a curator. These people are experts at preserving the past, all right? Their job is to be up to date on the past. Keep it all in order. Listen to me. They live on memories. That's the museum keeper. Now, history is cool, but your walk with God, y'all look at me now for a second. Your walk with God is never to collect dust, it's to kick up some dust. That's what God has called us to, all right? Here's, here's the standard. Here's the thing we need to watch out for. When your greatest stories about being used by God are creating dust, it's time to move forward. I said it's time to move forward. And, uh, man, you got to get started because six months turns into three years, turns into five years, turns into 15 years very quickly in our life where we're stagnant, all right? Y'all look at me now on this one, too. Our God is a right now God, and he has some things for you to grow in right now. I love reading about David because David served God at 17 years old, and I really do love that. But you know what I love even more? When I read about Joshua and Caleb who were doing great things for God at 80, 80 years old. I, I celebrate that. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I shoot for right there. Don't you want that in your life? They refuse to be museum keepers. Here, here's the verse that we're aiming for right here, or a couple of verses. Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14. Paul said it. How many of y'all think Paul accomplished a few things in his life? Okay, well, look what he said. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Some of you have some stuff that you're like, man, yes, I need to forget that stuff. But what about all the wins and all these things that God's done in you? Maybe that's some years ago. He said, yeah, that's great, but I forget that too because, look, I strain forward to what is ahead. Look at verse 14. I press on. Everybody say, press on. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul said that. And that's what we say too. Okay, that's the first mindset. But here's another one. It's, it's a, a settling mindset. You write this down. Settlers. You might know some settlers. You might be a settler. A settler is a person who settles. <laughs> that's Cajun logic right there, man. It's just these are people who settle. They find their comfort zone and they build their life on it right there. And uh, the Oregon Trail, have you ever heard of that? I'm not talking about the video game where everyone dies of dysentery. <laughs> Did anyone ever solve that game? Listen, I'm talking about the actual Oregon Trail, all right, in history. Here's what, here's what they say, though. It's riddled with the aftermath of people that said, that's far enough. I can't make it anymore. For some, it was the view, like they saw a great view. I'm going to build my house right here. I'm not going forward. For others, it was like the suffering right? They couldn't take it anymore. I'm stopping right here. And I do get that. I want to show you a Bible story. Actually, it's about Abraham's family. And I'm going to show you how this mentality attached to Abraham's dad. His name is Terah. Genesis 11, verse 31. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. 
Some of y'all, this is like a new thing for you. You didn't know this. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Everybody say settled. Somebody said one time, I believe the whole Bible, including the maps. Did y'all know there's maps in the back of your Bible? Well, in those maps, in one of those maps is the journey of Abraham. Did you know it was his father that started it? Yeah. His father, Terah, started going to Canaan. And uh, what happened was that he, halfway there, he stopped in a place called Haran. Haran was like the vacation spot of the Middle East. Basically, it was Destin, Florida. Everybody driving around with a latte in their hands, driving around in golf carts, this kind of stuff, okay? So they stopped there because it was really cool, you know? But he didn't make it. He settled. He stopped halfway. And here's what settlers do. They find a comfort zone with God, and they just settle in right there. Because like, hey, I'm a whole lot further away from where I was, you know? Thank God I'm not what I used to be, right? Nothing wrong with that. Except that it's not all that God has for you, but it's better than where you used to be. You get caught in this mentality. Can I say something? It's a dangerous place. Why is it dangerous? Because that's the place where dreams get put on the shelf. It's a dangerous place also because that's where you start losing your passion for God and for the things of God. And it's a little easier to get drawn over into the world and you start losing your conviction more and more. Hey, listen, I have to watch out for it. Sometimes I, I've found in my life, I'm like, wow, we've done a lot of great things, you know. And man, I mean, come on, there's a lot of people coming to this church. Wow, you know, and it's, it's, there's a tendency to want to go ahead and settle in on what you got and maintain. But that's dangerous. And I have to shake myself up. You ever have to do that? <laughs> Sometimes I wish I really could literally shake myself. And, and here's what I have to do and say, look, you know what, God, I know you're not through with me. Are you here today? God, what else do you want to do in me? How about my character? Oh, there's a lot of that left to change. How about outside of me, around me, in the world around me? Oh, yes. See, there are territories inside of you and outside of you that still need winning. And you're God's man, you're God's woman. Can I have a better amen in the house of God? That brings me to the third mindset. This is where we need to be, and that is pioneers. That's what we are. Write that down. You're a pioneer. Right alongside Jesus, Paul said in that verse that we read in Philippians 3 earlier, I had you repeat it. He said, I press on. Remember that? I press on. Like, there's a, there's a little bit of resistance in that, isn't there? But, but, but there's also the idea of looking forward. That is a pioneer. You see, their best days are not behind them. They're not living in a rut. They're not settled into a comfort zone. Pioneers are always pressing forward to what God has for their life. That's who we are called to be. Amen? It's like pioneers have this dream inside of them that's like gasoline that lights their soul on fire. It's fun to be around pioneers. I love it, all right? And here's what else they do. Pioneers discard junk that's going to slow them down on their journey. It's just like uh, that Oregon Trail, right, that I was talking about earlier. Archaeologists and historians are still, they still find all kinds of things on the trail, like family heirlooms, different chests. They found a piano. I mean, things that people started out with on their journey, and then the Pioneer family said, there's no way we're going to make it to where we're going if we keep hauling around this junk with us. Is that preaching to anybody else in here? Good, because it pretty much preaches itself. Here's something else Pioneers know, that they cannot get there on their own, that trailblazing is a team sport. And so with that, let me move on to this other part of the, uh, of the talk here. And uh, to get there, though, I want to say something. I loved Easter. Oh, my goodness. Man, it's like Super Bowl weekend, right? And uh, because I love seeing the room filled with people. And I love seeing people come to Christ. And I love seeing a whole row of people raise their hand for Jesus. But can I tell you, there's one thing that trumps even that. And that is this. Whenever I'm able to help somebody take another step for Jesus in their life, man, I geek out on it. Man, this is what, this is, what, why, why am I so excited about it? Because I'll tell you, that's real revival. That's what it is. It's more than a moment. Revival is more than a feeling. Any Boston fans in the house? I'm just kidding. Showing my age there. 
but y'all listen, revival is when people take the next step that God has for them in their life, and they keep taking the next step, and the next step, and the next step. That's how it is. What is your next step? What, as long as you have breath, raise your hand if you have breath in here. Come on. If you're sucking up air on this planet, God has a next step for you. What is it? He has purpose. If he didn't have a purpose for you, you might as well go to heaven because it's a lot better than here. But the reason you're here is because you do have purpose. God has ordained that. So don't settle into a comfort zone today. Please move. Take a step. Amen? Paul had a way that he prayed. It was a spiritual strategy that he prayed for people in the churches he planted. And you can see it in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. He prayed this prayer, and, and it's so cool, this strategy. And it sums up the heart of your pastors here at New Life Church. This is what we want for you. This is our prayer for you. Let's read verses 15 through 20, Ephesians 1. For this reason, he says, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Man, I think about you guys like that. Many of you are fun to pastor. Many of you are. All right, moving on. Verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Remember, he's praying this for Christians. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. That's a good prayer. It's a good verse. That's a good life. That's what we pray for you. Here's four things we do as a church and as believers. Write this down. Number one, it has to be number one, follow Jesus. He's the shepherd. He's the leader. We follow him. Follow Jesus. Paul said it like this uh, in verse 17 that we just read there. He said, so that you, you will know him better. You will know him better. Like that's the goal. That word know in the Greek, is, is closely related to the word in Hebrew that we translate know, and it's when Adam knew Eve, like that terminology, Adam knew Eve. Well, in that instance, it meant intimacy. In the broader sense, it means very close to someone. I'm talking relationally, okay? Very close relationally. So I want you to think about that. That's the goal, right, with Jesus, to know him better. Look, what, those people who just got baptized today, why did they do that? Why did they do that? Because they were following closely to Jesus in relationship with him. And they're doing what he's asking of them. That's why. Look, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, it's the Great Commission. Jesus said it. Therefore, go. Well, that's an action word right there. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you even to the end of the age. That's it. Baptism is one step in following Jesus. It's a great first step. We have many, many, many more, but let me tell you about baptism for a second. Baptism is me identifying with Jesus, right? Jesus was buried and went under the ground. I am baptized in water. I go into the water. Jesus was raised to new life. I am raised up to a new life as well. This is me identifying with him. Let me, let me put it in terms you might understand even better. Baptism is when you put a ring on it. You familiar with this terminology? Putting a ring on it. Okay. Imagine, if you will, if when I asked Kamani to marry me, can you just, just imagine this? And I told her, Kamani, look, I'm a private person. You know, I, look, I, uh, I love you, but we don't need to go public with this thing. In fact, let's not wear our rings in public. No reason to put the rings out in public. We'll just love each other in private. How many of y'all think that was going to fly? <laughs> like a lead balloon. Yeah. First of all, I would, never, I would never ask her that because I love her. But also because she's half Cajun, half Irish, she'll cut me. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just, there's that. But seriously, Kamani's not a side chick. 
And baptism is you telling the world, look, I've turned my back on you, the world, and I'm going with Jesus. He's my Lord. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm with him. That's what baptism is. And some have done that today, taken that step. Some of you still need to do that maybe, okay? Number two, let's talk about the other thing we do. We grow together. And this is fun. We grow together. I thank God that he set this up where we're not just by ourselves as Christians. Psalm 92, verse 12 and 13. Look at this verse. The righteous. Now, who are the righteous? We know this, uh, that Jesus died for us, for our sin. We know that this term, it refers to being in a right standing with God. And we know that it's because of Jesus and what he did. If we have him as our Lord and Savior, that now we have been made the righteous, actually the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So that applies to us, right? Say amen. Amen says, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. So does just anybody flourish? Who flourishes? Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. Does it say somebody who shows up to church every once in a while? No. It says those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall what? Shall flourish? Good, you're getting this. In the courts of our God. How does all this work? I'll tell you. There are seeds planted inside of you from heaven when you get saved. And when you plant yourself in God's house, and when you get connected to his people, and you get under the teaching of his word like this, then some things are going to start to produce fruit in your life. It's like a miracle, man. It's so fun to watch. There's things inside of you that you don't even know they're there. It's lying dormant. There are levels for you to climb and new gears for you to shift into. Okay? But it's all beneath the surface. And uh, for some of you, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've experienced this. But to illustrate this, I want to show you something. I wanted you to look at this uh, photo of Death Valley. All right? Now, this is not the one that LSU football plays in. This is the actual Death Valley. Valley, like the driest place on the planet, some people say. It hardly ever rains there, and because of that, they say nothing can grow there. Like it's impossible because it's so dry. Until one season in 2005 when it rained, listen, it, within like a couple of months, maybe a month, it rained seven inches, kind of like it did in my house last night, okay? Seven inches. And so here's what's amazing. Look what happened Show this next photo. Look at that. And scientists, they want to rename Death Valley to Dormant Valley now because they know something now. They know there were seeds there all along, but where were they? Under the surface, just waiting for water. And when water hit the desert, look out. Now that fires me up as a pastor because I know some of you, you got these things under the surface of your life, and you're not dead. You're just dormant. You get the water in there. Come on, you get in with us, man. You get plugged in, and just like that verse said, you're going to flourish, flourish. Hey, I'll tell you this. Our Connect class is coming this Thursday, and Kamani and I are going to share our heart for you, for our church, for our community. And uh, listen, what I, I'm telling you, we're going to try to get you connected. Help me help you flourish. That's what I'm telling you. Amen? So sign up to that. All right, you ready for the third one? If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. All right, write this down. We're going to serve each other, too. This is what we do as the body of Christ. We serve each other. Serve each other. And uh, let's go to Ephesians 1. Let's go back to verse 18 there. It says this. I pray, this is part of Paul's prayer, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That's interesting. The eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Y'all want to know something that I've learned? Your life doesn't follow your physical eyes. Your life follows the eyes of your heart. What do I mean? Like, whatever lights up your heart, it really lights you up. Right? It just lights your entire person. So you need to be around people who light you up. And you need to light other people up. That's what I'm talking about, man. This is what the Lord wants for us. Now, I'm going to use an illustration and it's a little weird because it's about monkeys. But you're going to have to hang with me. I'm telling you right now, okay? Because I was reading about this, and researchers put a monkey in a cage, 
And uh, they tied a banana above it to the top of the cage, about 10 feet above it. And uh, they did this thing. They wanted to see how he responded. So as he was cr- climbing up to get the, get, to get the uh, banana, right when he went to grab the banana, they threw a cup of cold water in his face. Yeah, I know. The earlier service had the same reaction. People are really sympathetic toward monkeys. It's interesting. Anyway, so, so, so it took about three or four times for them to do this cold water treatment before the monkey finally just gave up. I'm not trying that again. Well, they did that with a lot of monkeys individually, and then they said, let's put them all together, and let's see what they do. They put all the monkeys together, and the monkeys just sat there looking at each other like, we're not going for that banana. <laughs> you know, they, they had learned, right? Well, the one researcher said, let's put one monkey who's not been subjected to the cold water treatment in there with those monkeys, see what happens. They did that, and that one monkey, well, he immediately starts for the banana. And, and you know what happened after that? Those other monkeys wouldn't even let him try. They pulled him down, and they said, oh, bro, you don't want to do that. <laughs> We've seen what happens to people. <laughs> it's like, now, why am I telling you this story about monkeys getting a banana? Can I tell you why? Because here's my dream. My dream is to have a church that helps people get the banana to get to the top, to get to the dream, to get to the calling that God has put on their life. That's why we exist, all right? And we're going to serve each other, man. We're going to help each other get there. Join one of our serve teams. It's what we do here. Inspire some people around you, and let's go for God together, amen? Look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork. One translation says, masterpiece, like his work of art. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You weren't saved by works, but you certainly were saved for some works. Which God, look at this, about the works he's prepared in advance for us to do. That's pretty cool. And this certainly does not say, bruh, the church could really use your help around here every once in a while. Although that's 100% true and biblical. But what this verse is saying is that, listen, God, when he created you, had you in his mind, and created you to do some things. Man, isn't that exciting? And oh, by the way, when you hop in with other people doing that thing, there's nothing like it in the world. The fulfillment, the joy, the life that comes from that, highly recommend it. I wouldn't do life any other way. You ready for the last one? It's my favorite. All right, write this down. Live on mission. This is what we do here. We live on mission. What we do as believers, we live on mission. And so, have y'all ever heard that saying that the church is the hope of the world? Raise your hand if you ever heard that. The church is the hope of the world. Yeah, I mean it sounds good, but it's not really true. Okay, it's not. It's not true. Not really. It should be the church mobilized and on mission is the hope of the world, because man, you can hey. There could be a church where everybody in it is sitting on their blessed assurance doing nothing. That is not the hope of the world. I lost some of y'all, I think. Probably when I said sitting on your blessed assurance. I'll say it again. No. Okay, moving on. Can y'all look at me? We're on mission. We're on mission. So that means what? That means we're all, we're thinking about our community, right? We're thinking about people, how we can serve them. We're, we're praying. We're serving each other in the church. We're using our gifts, our talents, our time, all of this. And you know what else we're doing? Inviting our lost friends. Yes. Hey, every one of you has a friend that needs to, be, needs to be sitting with you by September. Right here. Come on, y'all, think, y'all thinking about that right now, right? How about August? How about next week? I mean, God's timing, right? But this is true of every one of us in here. And uh, you've got to, t- every one of you have got to take personal responsibility that I'm going to live on mission. That's not my job. I can... Encourage you like I'm doing now, but ultimately you got to take that responsibility. You are in now. You got to help bring others in. This is the church. You know, the church is the only organization on the planet that does not exist for the people already in it. We here exist for the 50 families out there who need restoration. They need healing. They need salvation. Man, they need Jesus. They need freedom. That's why we exist. And so I thought about it this way. Where are you at today? Think about that. Where am I at today in all this? And I thought about this. You know, 
there are two types of drivers on the highway. There's the one that, uh, that knows how to honk at other drivers, really lay into it. And then there's those who honk like nice little Christians, like, beep, beep, and a little sorry wave. I'm sorry. <laughs> Today is not a nice Christian honk. I hope that you hear a Mack truck bearing down on you. Go do something. All right? In other words, go or get out the way. That's what you're hearing, all right? And with that, I want to close with one more story. It wasn't from Easter, but maybe a, it wasn't that long ago. And it was a guy in our church, a member of our church. He just told me this this past week. And uh, he had a friend of his, a good friend of his, whose marriage was really in trouble, was pretty bad off. And uh, this guy was one step away from an actual affair. He'd been texting, but he was one step away from an affair. And so the member prayed for and invited his friend. And uh, his friend came, actually came to our, our men's group on Friday morning and then came to a service. Y'all listen to me. God did something in his life. This guy was convicted I'm talking about the Holy Spirit got involved, and he repented. Okay, God is changing his life. He, he's excited about the changes God is doing in his life, and he's telling all his friends about the changes that God is doing in his life. Can I say that's a miracle right there? That's a miracle. But hold on. That miracle started because one man in our church decided, I need to take personal responsibility for my friend it's because that member of our church viewed his life, listen, that he was where he was at, that this friendship he had was because of God's purpose. And can I beg you, church? Man, if there's one thing I can, can I just beg you? Please, this will make your pastor so happy. If every one of you in here, including myself, we would all look at our lives like that one member did, like that we are here because everywhere around us, work, school, our family, we're here because God has a purpose for us in those people's lives. Can I have an amen? amen. Please, let's do that. Can we do that together? Can we pray about that? Bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord, I ask you, first of all, to help us in this. We really want to live this way. Help us to live on mission God, if there are Christians in here, hey, maybe you're in here and you love God with all your heart, but you feel like maybe you settled, settled somewhere, like we talked about earlier. You know it. Hey, could you just tell God about that? Just go ahead and tell him, look, I've settled. I've gotten more involved. All those things that so easily entangle, things of the world, it's just gotten my focus off. Just tell him that right now. Come on, all around this room. Again, you're a Christian, but you felt like you've settled somewhere. Just tell him, I want to be a pioneer again. I want to do what you've called me to do. Lord, we all pray that. We want to follow you as, you as our leader and our shepherd. And Lord, we want to grow together. God, help us do that. We want to serve together, serve each other. And Lord, we want to live on mission. It's in Jesus' name. I pray New Life Church would stay on mission. And God, if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you, would you draw them, draw them to yourself? Hey, if you're in here and you don't know the Lord, again, personally, close relationship, daily, this is what we're talking about. If you have a relationship with him, you would know it. He wants you in his family. He wants to save you. He doesn't want you to spend eternity in hell separated from him. No, it's why he came and got on the cross and rose from the grave so you could have a new life. Maybe you need to call on his name. The Bible says if you call on him, he will save you. So I want to lead you in a prayer. Maybe you've just wandered from him and, and you want to recommit your life to him. A lot of people did that last weekend. But let me ask you this. Do this one thing for me. I'm not going to call you to the front. But if that's you, raise your hand toward heaven right now. All around this room, you're saying, I want to live for Jesus. I want him to change me. Yep. I want him to come into my life. I recommit my life to him. Yeah, all over this room. You can put your hands down. Just pray something like this, you and God. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Forgive me for trying to run my life the way I think is best. Lord, you call the shots now. Just tell him that. Come into my life and change me. Save me, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, come on, amen. Come on, amen.
Give the Lord a hand for what he did.